I'm Brooke Eve. Welcome to VBF Online. Please visit our website, vbf.org, and while you're there, you can watch the latest message. Follow us on social media. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also donate to our ministry by going and clicking the Tithe Here button. You can do that, or you can also mail us a check. If you have a cool story that you would like to share with us, you can email us at share at vbf.org. Thank you so much for watching BBF Online. We hope that you enjoy the message. Good morning, Valley Bible. How's everybody doing? I got one word for somebody. I was reading this verse. I can't get it out of my mind. Lamentations 3. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him. Yes. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for what you are going to do today. We believe it. We have faith in it. We trust in you, God. That right now, they're in worship, God. Holy Spirit, take over. Take over everything. Anoint the worship team. Anoint Pastor Doug. And anoint us to be hearers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Come on, church. We encourage you to engage in worship this morning as we declare these truths. Freedom is coming in this house. Amen. There is a promise and waiting for me. Sometimes there's an ocean that lies in between. And I'll keep on traveling the path where you've been till I'm right where you want me. That's where I will be. We declare freedom's coming.
Hello, BBF ladies. We would love to invite you to our Derby Day party on Saturday, April 27th from 11 to 1 p.m. in Station 316 at the main campus. We are going to transform the building to a place for fun games, for raffle baskets, for great food, and the tickets are only $20 per person. It includes it all, including a great time with friends. So grab those hats and purchase your tickets at bbfwomen.com. Good morning, church. How are you guys doing? You guys doing good? Like uh, that video was saying, that announcement is for the ladies. Uh, you guys do have that Derby Day party. Purchase those tickets online or you can do it at um, online, bbf.org. I think that's the only way you can do it. So uh, make sure you mark your calendars for that date. If this is your first time, we want to welcome you. We want to welcome everyone online as well um, and everyone else. I feel like I say that all the time, only the new people I welcome, but welcome everyone. You guys made it to church. It's Sunday. We're going to dive into what it is that God is going to speak into our lives, and we really are glad that you're here. So I got a couple of announcements. I'm going to run through them as fast as possible, and then we're going to jump into another amazing worship song. But real quick, we have Embrace Grace Baby Shower. Um, if you guys are wondering what this is, this is it's a ministry for young uh, moms who find themselves in an unexpected pregnancy and choose life for their little ones. And this is what you guys did. This is VBF. They went out and showered her with gifts, showed her love, showed her that there is a community behind her and just the power of being in the body of Christ. So we got to do that for her. And we just want to say thank you to all you guys. And um, if you know of someone who uh, can be a part of this ministry, let them know uh, that we have something for everyone. And so thank you guys again for all that you've done and showed her um, that there is support behind her. Teen Challenge is hosting their annual barbecue, and Pastor Ron Vietti is going to be speaking at it. We also have all of our worship team out there. And so if you want to go to this, this is Friday, April 26th at 5.30 p.m. You can buy tickets. This is by calling this number, 661-399-2273, and it's a great cause. So come out. It's a dinner an amazing message and an amazing worship from our team. We also have an opportunity drawing fundraiser for this brand new, I don't know if it's brand new, but it's a motorcycle. It's a 2008, a brand new 2008 Honda motorcycle. And that can be yours. Um, opportunity drawings are gonna help support, all the, the proceeds are gonna help support uh, the VBF campus improvements. But it's uh, Father's Day, June 16th, is when we are gonna be uh, letting you know who is taking this brand new 2008 motorcycle home. Um, plus one project is uh, today. So if you brought a separate dollar, as you guys leave, the ushers uh, will be taking those from you on exit. If you haven't heard of our Plus One ministry, it's amazing. God just stretches a dollar out. We've been able to purchase clothes, groceries, beds, helped um, homeless, all kinds of stuff. And this is all through God. So it's just one dollar on your way out and watch what God does with that dollar. We do have a volunteer of the week. We have Mike Galindo, everyone. This guy's amazing. We came um, on Saturday, uh, we had an event, and he's out here pressure washing, doing all, just him by himself, cleaning this entire campus, making it look pretty. This is what he does. He's been attending VBF since 2013. So uh, he's helped in parking, security, and occasionally coming out here, midweek service, and making sure the campus looks nice. So if you see him around, give him a high five, encourage him, buy him some coffee, I don't know. This guy's amazing. We love you, Mike. Thank you for all that you do. And then ties and offerings, you guys know the drill. We have these purple baskets, a kiosk in the foyer. You go to our website at vbf.org, mail a check-in to 2300 East Brundage Lane, or text the word tithe to 855-996-9555. With that being said, I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer. We have another amazing worship song. I'm going to get started with what God is going to do today. So if you can bow your heads, let's pray this. Father, God, we ask right now, this is the last worship song. Lord, we pray, God, that we would be able to lay down our burdens at your feet. God, that we would believe that there is healing that is going to happen in our marriages, in our families, within ourselves. God, and we believe that you're going to do it. We believe that you're going to speak to us. God, we believe, God, that your presence is here. 
we ask that you'd bless the giver, that you'd bless the offering, that you'd bless the receiver. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Well, come on, let's stand up together. Check, check. 
I'm excited to announce that today we do have a guest speaker. He's an amazing leader out at our Vegas campus. He's also played for the Milwaukee Brewers. Guys, give it up for Pastor Doug Lohman. Gennaro's gullible. I told him, hey, when you, I said, when you introduce me, tell him that I played 63 days in the major leagues, but I made the Hall of Fame. He goes, you did? I said, no. <laughs> Good to see everybody. Welcome, welcome. Hello to you online as well. Uh, boy, something is going on in the churches of America, a good thing. I don't know what it is, but uh, I heard here that you guys had the largest Easter that you've had in several years here. Uh, fantastic. Huge numbers. Vegas, we set an all-time high as far as number of people for Easter. In the 21-year history of our church, we, we had the most people attend ever. My son, who attends a big church back in Mississippi, they had the largest crowd they ever had. So I don't know. I was talking with the guys in the back there. Remember after, if you're around long enough, old enough, remember right after 9-11? I think it happened like whatever, Monday, whatever. That following Wednesday, which Wednesday's typically aren't real big, was packed uh, when I was in Colorado and packed here. Uh, people are like, man, I, you know, it's scary. I need God. Maybe that's taking place now with all the craziness going around the world. People are, are flocking to God and flocking to churches. So uh, that's a good thing. Well, hey, uh, before we get too far away from Easter, uh, I want to just remind us the Easter story went on. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. Jesus did not ascend back to the Father for 40 days. He hung around on earth for 40 days and uh, did some amazing things. And I want to talk about some of those things here today. Uh, in fact, in Acts chapter 1, let, let's start right there. Acts 1, verse 1. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had given orders by the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after suffering, uh, suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days, and speaking of things regarding the kingdom of God. So he stayed here for 40 days, and he began to talk to them about the, the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom of God is the invisible kingdom of God with Jesus as king. And he said, I, I want what is taking place up in heaven. I want it to come down here. And I want you, church, to be. I want you to be the people that will extend the kingdom down here to earth. In fact, the disciples ask Jesus, when they, they ask him, teach us to pray. Remember that portion in Matthew chapter 6? Teach us to pray. How do we pray? And Jesus led them in the Lord's Prayer. And I was going to recite it by myself today. But I'm going to just uh, bring back some memories, hopefully good memories for some of you Catholics today. So I'm going to ask everybody to stand up if you would. Everybody stand. Come on, stand with me. If you know the Lord's Prayer, let's recite it together. If you don't know it, just mouth it and just impress the person next to you like, man, this, he knows the Lord's Prayer. Look at he's saying it. All right, ready? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. And everybody can say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you want to cross yourself, that's cool too. No judgment here. The kingdom of God has principles and values that are completely different and at odds with the domain of Satan that exists here on earth. The kingdom and the domain of Satan, they clash. You feel that clashing, don't you? You, you feel it at work oftentimes. If you're the 
only Christian may be there and everybody else is an unbeliever and they're talking about all their crazy stuff that unbelievers talk about. You feel that, don't you, that tension and like I feel awkward here and, and I probably make them feel awkward. You feel it at the Little League games. You feel it at family gatherings if you're maybe the only believer there. You, you get frustrated and you scratch your head and you shake your head uh, when you watch the mainstream news at some of the decisions that are made. You say, oh my gosh, what are these people thinking well, I want to look today at three conversations that Jesus had in that 40-day period uh, about the kingdom of God. I want to bring out three super important principles that I, I think we need to know. And here's the first one. It's found in Luke chapter 24, verse 13. It begins, And behold, on that very day, two of them. Th what day is this? The third day. This is right after Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came and reported, hey, the tomb's empty. And so, so man, that news is spreading. And on that third day, that very same day, two of them uh, were going to a village named Emmaus, which was 60 stadia from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were traveling, talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? Obviously, he knew the answer. He just wanted to see kind of what they were thinking. And they came to a stop looking sad. Key thing there. They came to a stop looking sad. One of them named Cleopas answered and said to him, are you possibly the only one living near Jerusalem who does not know about the things that happened here in these days? In other words, like, duh. Where have you been? The whole city is just on fire with, with Jesus, and now they can't find his body. And uh, the women said that he, he resurrected. And made, Where have you been? And he said to them, uh, what sort of things? And they said to him, those about Jesus the Nazarene, who proved to be a prophet mighty in deed and word inside of God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. That's why they're sad. They, 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 were, they thought he was the Messiah, but now they're sad. That obviously wasn't him. Indeed, besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us left us bewildered when they were at the tomb early in the morning. And did not find his body. They came saying they had also seen a vision of angels that said he was alive. And so some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the woman also had said. But they, him, they did not see. And then he said to them, you foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to come into his glory? Then beginning with Moses... And with all the prophets, he explained to them the things written about himself in the scriptures. Here's the first kingdom truth. Not knowing God's word can leave you sad and confused. Oh, you got to get this one down. They were sad. They were confused. We don't know what's going on. We don't know who to believe. They were on a bummer. Why? Because they missed their Messiah. They missed Jesus, who was the promised Messiah. Why? Because they were looking for something different than what Jesus was. They were looking for the military Messiah. They were looking for the, the Messiah who was going to come and free them from those horrible Romans who had invaded their country and, and, and were, were oppressors. And they were saying, oh, when the Messiah comes, he'll rout these guys out and we'll get back to having our pure Jewish nation. And, and when Jesus didn't fulfill what they thought in their mind he would, they rejected him. He can't be the Messiah then. But if they had only read their Bibles, the Old Testament clearly showed that the Messiah when he first came, would be a suffering one, not a conquering one. He would be a suffering Messiah. Isaiah 53, I'm not going to read all the verses, but just some, some of those verses there in Isaiah 53 say things like, he would be despised and forsaken of men. He would be a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. He would be pierced through for our transgressions. Does that sound like a real you know, conquering? No, it sounds like a suffering Messiah. 
Isaiah 53, 10 says, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. If they had only read the scriptures that they so treasured, just read it with an open mind, they would have said, he checks every box. He checks every box. Yeah, check this. He suffered. Check this. He's pierced. Check this. They would have said, oh, my gosh, this is he. But they didn't do their homework. They didn't read their Bibles. Now, what's the application for you and I? <clears throat> if we don't go into life's events, seasons of life, understanding what God has said about them, there's a good chance that you're going to get disillusioned, you're going to get confused, and quite possibly sad because you don't understand things when God has actually said, hey, here's, let me talk to you about this so, so you'll know going in what to expect. You'll know how to do things properly. You'll know how to think properly. We, we could avoid so much heartache. For instance, let me give you an example. Marriage. Vicki and I have been married 47 years come November, I think. I'm losing track. I think it's 47 years. She pressed me hard to marry her. We were high school sweethearts, and I, I just signed my first contract to play baseball. And, oh, marry me. Don't go away without me. And I, I wanted to go and play as a single guy. I wanted to go focus on baseball. And, and, and so, uh, oh, please marry me, and I'm not going to marry you. And about halfway through the season, I was calling her, I love you. I miss you. And I, I married her the following year. And she was 19. I was 20. And, oh, my God. Well, not, not saved. We fought like cats and dogs. Oh, my gosh. Nobody here, I don't think, fought like Vicky and I did. Some of you might beg to differ with that, but we fought, man. And oh man, I remember one time getting mad at her and, and, and taking a, a full suitcase. She wanted to go with me on a road trip uh, in baseball. And I, I don't want you to, I was going to, we we're going to Reno, from Stockton to Reno. And I, that was a boys' trip. We we're going to go there and have fun. I didn't want her to go with us. I want to go. No, you're not going. We don't have the money, I'd say. And, and now I want to go, and I got mad, and, and finally threw the suitcase. I threw a suitcase to a closet door at our apartment, just mad and angry. She had a temper. We were playing over. We had an apartment over at West High in the off season one time, and we were playing ping pong, and I would just toy with her. She's so competitive. I would toy with her. I said, okay, well, let's start off. We'll play to 21. Uh, I'll give you 17. Right now, it's 17, nothing you. And I'd let her get up to 19 and just come back and smoke her right on the, on the winning point. And, oh, my gosh, you get mad. And one time she couldn't resist, and she had a beer. Miss Vicky had a beer bottle in her hand and threw it at me as hard as she could. <laughs> Boom, I ducked, and that beer bottle hit the back wall there. We fought. We went into marriage blind. We didn't know what God's word had to say about marriage. Oh, if we'd have been saved and read we, we could have avoided so many things. God has spoken about marriage. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 27, 28. Paul says there, are you bound to a wife? In other words, are you married to a wife? Don't seek to be released. Don't seek to get divorced. Are you released from a wife? Don't seek a wife. In other words, are you single? If you're single, don't, don't seek to get married. Some of you singles, you avoid a lot of heartache if you just don't get married. But if God brings you somebody, Awesome. He says, but if you marry, you haven't sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Here it is. Yet such people as yourselves will have trouble in this life. And I'm trying to spare you. Husbands, if you say amen to that, you're the dumbest man in the face of the earth. <laughs> Don't say amen. Oh, man, I wish I'd have known that. I would have married her. But marriage, hey, it's, it's got benefits. We all love it, don't we? Don't we? Yeah, don't we? Say yeah, nod. But it's difficult. Man, you got two different people, and you got two different ideas on how to raise kids, and you got two different uh, temperaments. Oh, man, it's, <clears throat> it can be difficult. And Paul says, hey, if you can handle this, man, just stay single. But if you don't have to get to singleness, then, then go ahead and marry. And if Vicky and I would have known that, that, hey, marriage is hard, we would have probably sought more attention, but we didn't read God's word. Same thing with having kids, having children. Oh, couples are so happy when they find out they're having children. Oh, I can't wait for little Johnny to show up and little Susie and all oh, that little bundle of joy and then go fix up the room and buy clothes and, and have a, you know, a reveal and, 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 oh, it's so good and it's so awesome. The little bundle of joy is there. And then about 13, that little bundle of joy starts growing horns. 
You start, you talk to your financial guy and say, hey, you know that money we're putting away for the college fund? Is there any way we can withdraw that? I think we're going to put him in military school for about three years. <laughs> but again, if parents would read God's word, what does God's word say about parenting? Well, Proverbs 13, 24, look what it says there. He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. Same idea in Proverbs twenty two fifteen. 15. Uh, yeah. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. In other words, kids, man, they're, they're, they're born with just crazy foolish things they do. Kids just stuff, stick stuff up their nose and everywhere else and just do the craziest stuff. And so parents, you have to discipline. You have to train if you're going to be a good parent, most likely you're going to go to bed exhausted every night. Vicki tells a story of, of raising our son, Seth. My daughter, Sarah, was just a piece of cake. She was just one of those compliant girls and has always been just an awesome kid. Seth, it was like raising a, a wild banshee. I don't know, he's just from another planet sometimes. And, and just, just a type A type kid. And Vic, I'd come home from, uh, when I was on staff here, come home for dinner, Vicky's crying. What are you crying about? Dude, all I did was spank Seth all day. I feel so hot, you spanked him all day. <laughs> well, you know what? It paid off. Because Seth is, is such a neat man of God right now. And, and he was really enjoyable to raise as a teenager. <laughs> and, and he really was. I mean, it's type A, you have challenges. But see, here, here's my philosophy on parenting. This isn't a parenting teaching. But here's, here's my philosophy. If you will do the hard work, parents, by the time that they're six years old, get them under control. In other words, when you say no, you just have to say it one time. If, 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 if you have them under control by the time they're six, you pretty much got them for the rest of their, their life while they're living with you. You got them. If you got them by six. If you don't have them by six years old, ooh, ooh, man, you've you got some tough years coming up. If you're a little six-year-old, you know, you say, go clean your room. No. Come inside. Don't run in the street. No. You can't tell me what to do. And, oh, look at He's such a little, he's so feisty. <laughs> that's what, that's what parents, that's how they explain it away. Hey, he's so ornery, just like me when I was young. I don't think it's cute. I don't think it's cute at all. Because I know that little six-year-old, if you think it's cute, which I don't, but if you think it's cute when they're six, it won't be cute when they're 15 or 16 and they come and chest you up, mom, and say, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? That'll happen. You get them under control when they're six, you'll have some fun years. If not, ooh, you're going to have some tough years. That's what God's word says. That's why we read it, to know how to raise kids properly. Same thing with retirement. I'm experiencing that now. I'm kind of semi-retired. I just pretty much just teach now in the church. I don't go in the office. I don't do a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff. But everybody tells, and I knew better because I've been reading God's word, but people that don't read, they think, oh, man, the golden years. Ah, just golf, just eat out all the time. No stress, no problems. Well, the reality is for many, your get up and go has got up and left. So now you have the money, but you don't have any energy to do anything with it. You spent all, worked your tail off your whole life. I got all this money. Oh, we're going to go vacation. Oh, man, I can't. I can't even walk now. <laughs> or you have the energy. Man, I'm in good shape, but you know what? I didn't plan for a retirement, so okay. We're going to go on a, a vacation. Where? Out at Lake Mean. We're going to camp out at Lake Mean for <laughs> three days out there. You begin to have health issues. That, that limit what you can do. But see, God spoke of these challenges in his word. If, if we knew it going in, we wouldn't be disappointed. We wouldn't be caught off guard. Ecclesiastes 12 is an interesting passage. For you older folks here, this will really uh, ring true for you. Look at Ecclesiastes 12, and I'm going to read from the Message Bible. Uh, it says there, honor and enjoy your creator while you're still young. Form a relationship with him. Get to know him. But build that foundation because you're going to need it when you get older. Before the years take their toll and your vigor wanes. 
before your vision dims. Anybody having to get older, you kind of start losing your sight and need readers all the time. And my wife just uh, had cataract surgery, had two cataracts removed. One one week, one the next week. And she says, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm looking at life through HD now, high definition. She said, I had no idea how dark everything was. In fact, she's got to wear these glasses around, you know, trying to light. Turn that light off. I said, man, it's not even that bright, but it's bright to her. Your eyes start going bad when you get older. <clears throat> the world blurs, and the winter years keep you close to the fire. When you get old, man, you, I, I used to be always hot. Of course, I was 50 pounds here. I was always hot. Man, turn the air on. Turn that thing on. It's hot in here. Now I'm like an old, cold man all the time, just always needing a jacket or something. And your muscle, you lose muscle, and you just uh, frail and cold. In old age, your body no longer, no longer serves you so well. Muscles slacken. Grip weakens. I can't even open some jars sometimes. I've got to pound a little lid on the, on the ground there. and That really challenges your manhood. Joints stiffen. The shades are pulled down in the world. Everything is kind of dark. You can't come and go at will. Sometimes you have to have other people help you. Things grind to a halt. The hum of the household fades away. All of a sudden now, there's no more kids in the house. It's an empty nest. And it's nice for a while, but man, it's like, it can be lonely. What's my purpose? I've been a parent for most of my time. What do I do now with my time? And you have a lot of older people just sit around and watch TV and just kind of waste away doing nothing. You're awakened now by the songbird. You can't sleep very good and you're up at the crack of dawn. And then you start eating dinner like at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Hikes to the mountains are a thing of the past. Yeah. Your mind says, I want to do it. I tell these old, older guys when we played church softball over in Las Vegas, I say, hey, guys, I'm telling you something. When you hit the ball, your mind says, run. You, you're a 70 year old man. Run. Don't do it. Your mind's a liar. Because you're going to fall. Ah! They get hit and they start running. Just out of nowhere, just runs. Boom. <laughs> Even a stroll down the road has its terrors. You ever notice old people drive real slow in the freeway? I notice I'm driving a little slower now. I make them say, oh, my gosh, everybody's driving so fast. Everything starts moving quick on you. Your hair turns apple blossom white. Adorning an impotent matchstick body. I'm, I'm going to leave it right there. Yes, you're well on your way to eternal rest while your friends make plans for your funeral. Doesn't that sound, aren't you glad you came to church today? I hope I encourage you today. <laughs> if, if Cleo and his buddy would have read God's word, they could have viewed his crucifixion and resurrection in such a whole new light. They could have been excited. They should have been excited. If you want to go through every season, every experience, every trial in life, then get into God's word. Know what he has to say about it. Learn, read up on it. That way you won't be like these two who were sad and confused. You, you, you can soar through those times. Here's the second kingdom truth that I want to talk about. Seek after the where, not the what. What am I talking about? Well, Matthew 28, let me, let me explain to you. Matthew 28, 8. And they left the tomb quickly. These are the two women, Mary and uh, Magdalene and the other Mary, with fear and great joy and ran to report to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Rejoice! And they came up and took hold of his feet and they worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Bring word to my brothers to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. And I'm sure these ladies said, And? Once they get to Galilee, and then what? Now remember, these disciples, they, they were fearful of their lives. The Jewish authorities had just killed Jesus and were probably coming after them next. Then what? what? What do we do once we get there? And Jesus was gone. Now, once they arrived in Galilee, he gave a little bit more information. Verse 16 of Matthew 28. There he said, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated to them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, Here it is, here's the what. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God's will for you and for me is to obey what he tells us. Often it's one step at a time. That's his will for our life. Obey him. Obedience. I believe the Lord doesn't initially tell us all that he wants us to know because it would freak us out. We're not ready for it. So he gives us information just bits at a time. I think he says, you don't have the faith yet to believe what I'm going to do in this situation. If I told you everything now, then, then I don't think you would keep going because you would say, this is impossible. I can't do this. I'm not strong enough. I'm not big enough. I don't have enough faith to trust you right now. So God has to build our faith. We see a, what a great example we're going to see of this in the life of Gideon. Let me just, just paraphrase it for you because this can be super important. Okay, Here's how God's working in your life. Okay, Gideon, in Judges chapter 6 and 7, God's people were, were being just uh, abused. They were being raided by a people called the Midianites. Israel did their, their unfortunate, familiar thing where they would fall away from God, serve the idols, and God would use other nations to come and get them. And so, so Gideon is there, and, and Gideon is uh, just doing what he's doing. In fact, these Midianites were so cruel, Israel would plant all their crops, grow it, plant it, and everything. And then all of a sudden, here comes Midian about harvest time saying, get out of here. And they were bigger and start, get out of here. And they'd take all their stuff. Bring, they'd bring thousands and thousands of their cattle and just eat all their corn, eat all their alfalfa. And just animals. And so Israel, what they had to start doing, they had to start taking some of their crops and going into caves and harvest it there so nobody could see it. So Gideon's in this cave, and the Lord says, Lo, mighty warrior. Gideon's like, talking to me? He says, yeah. I said, you're going to be my instrument that's going to deliver Israel from the Midianites. And Gideon says, oh, man. He says, I, I need to know that this is really you, Lord. And he says, I'm going to ask for a test. I'm going to pray that this piece of wool... I'm going to lay it on the ground, and I'm going to pray that if this is really you, if you're really going to use me to defeat, to lead our people to defeat Midian, then in the morning, let this piece of wool be soaked in dew, but all the ground around it, let it be dry. God said, okay. Sure enough, woke up in the morning, Gideon grabbed that piece of wool, squeezed a bunch of water out of it. He said, Lord, please, bear with me. Can I get one more test? This is such a big task. I, I, just, I just need to know this is you. Can I give you one more test? In the morning, I'm going to lay that same fleece out. In the morning, can you have that fleece be completely dry, but have all the ground around it be wet with dew? God says, okay. And sure enough, woke up in the morning, the ground was soaked, but the fleece was dry. And Gideon says, okay, I'll do it. And God says, okay, I, I, need, I need some uh, an army. Get an army. And so Gideon was able to round up 300 men. Now, 300 men is not a whole lot of guys. The Midian army had 135,000. But God told him, go grab 300 guys. And so he got 300 guys. And, uh, no, I, let, me, let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. He had about 2,300 guys, 23,000 guys. And he says, ask anybody that wants to go home, tell them that, hey, if you're fearful, you don't want to fight, you can go home. And all but 300 went home. All but 300 went home. He tested these guys to get down to the 300. Here's the test that, that he used to get them to 300. He said, take them to the water. And anybody who bends down on their knees and laps it like water, send them home. But anybody who just reaches down and cups it like that, those are the ones that I want. So only 300 did that. And many people have said, well, those are the, and it might be, these are the people that are alert. God wanted to alert people that, that kept their eyes up. They would just reach down. They wouldn't lower their head. They would just kind of reach down. Maybe, but here's my take on this thing. I think that those 300 dead he kept, those were the old guys. Guys that couldn't get down on their knees. <laughs> hey, help, help, I've fallen. I, I think he said, I can't even down, so I'm just going to. You find yourself doing it sometimes? Like, ugh. My wife, and son, she says, I don't, I don't want my back hurts. So she'll use her toes, pick up clothes. 
Yeah. She says, it saves me from bending down. I think those are 300 old guys, and God says, perfect, that's just what I want. Because if, if, if we have too many guys or too many strong guys, when I defeat Midian, you'll think that you did it. I, I want you to know that I did it. I want you to trust me. I don't want you to trust yourself. That's your problem. You're, trust, you're trusting everybody other than me. You're trusting these stupid idols. You're trusting yourself. I want you to know you can trust me. And here's how God did it. Well, wait a second. He needed one more faith builder. He told Gideon, he says, go down to the camp of the Midianites. They were laid out in the plain. As far as you could see, 135,000. He says, go down there at night. And if you're afraid, take Purah with you. So Gideon and Purah went down there. And he said, just go down there. Where? God probably, just, just go. I'll, I'll lead you. So they're down there just kind of peering over. And they hear a conversation. Two Midianites talking. And the guy says, man, I had this crazy dream. I saw this loaf of barley rolling down a hill, and it came into the camp of Midian and knocked down a tent, and it just completely leveled it. And his buddy said, well, that's, that's, that's none other than the, the sword of Gideon, that he's going to come in here, and he's going he's to defeat Midian. I don't know how he knew that, but, but that's what he said, and Gideon heard that, and it just built such faith in him. And he went back and told Israel, and said, man, this is a done deal. God has given us the victory, and he, he summoned them, and, and God did it in an amazing way. He said, I want you to take these 300 men, give, one of them, give them a trumpet in one hand and, and a pitcher, like a, we pour water, and have them put a torch inside of there. And I want, I want 100 here, I want 100 here, I want 100 here, surround the camp. And he said, when I blow, I get in, when I blow my horn, I want you to smash that pitcher. So now all of a sudden they have this torch, and I want you to blow that trumpet as loud as you can. So they did it. Gideon blew his. Bam. They did it. All of a sudden the torch comes on. They blow this thing. And it said it sent the camp of, of Midian into confusion. They, they begin to, to, to fight among themselves. I guess it was a common military practice that a torch, like a, a thousand soldiers would march behind one torch. So the Midianites thought they, they didn't realize there were just 300. They thought actually there was 300,000. And so they, they, were, they were just confused, and, and they said, you know, they, they were a bunch of tribes together. And all of a sudden, yeah, you, you turned on us. You told them. They started killing each other, and, and God used that to defeat them. 300 people defeated 135,000 people. But see, there's no way that Gideon could have handled the what until he kept going from place to place, God kept building his faith, kept building his faith, kept building his faith. And then he got to a point where all of a sudden now he had the faith to believe that God could do the impossible. And see, that's what God is doing in your life. That's what trials are for. Consider it joy when you encounter various trials. Why? Because uh, knowing that testing your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result that you might be perfect and complete. What? Lacking in nothing. He's building your faith. He's, 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 he's getting you to trust. He's getting you ready for eternity. And these things that you're going through right now, they're just faith builders. God is saying, do you trust me? Will you look to me? Will you believe me? Will you obey me even when you don't understand what's going on? Will you do what I say? That's how you grow. That's how you get big faith. And then lastly, here's the last kingdom principle. And let me set it up with a fishing story. How many of you like to fish? All right, here's a good fishing story. John chapter 21, verse 1. After these things, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. That's the Sea of Galilee. It's a lake, freshwater lake. And he revealed himself in this way. <clears throat> Simon Peter, Thomas, who was called Didymus, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Now, you have to understand, this isn't just a leisurely, hey, let's just go grab our poles and have some R&R. &R. Now, these, these were former commercial fishermen who dropped their business and began to follow Jesus for the last three years. So when Peter says, I'm going fishing, basically what he's saying is, I'm done being an apostle. I'm going back to what I was doing before I got saved. I'm quitting. I'm quitting. They said to him, we're also coming with you. And they said, hey, if you're going, you know, we might as well go. You're kind of our leader. And they went out and got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. 
you'll notice something about Peter. He didn't catch many fish until Jesus shows up. He, he just, there's another story. He just he, he gets skunked all the time until Jesus shows up. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that I was Jesus. They were 100 yards away. So Jesus said to them, children, you do not have any fish to eat, do you? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right hand side of the boat and you will find the fish. So they cast it, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great quantity of fish. Now, trusting in the Lord brings blessings. Yes, that, that is a kingdom principle as well. Trusting in God brings blessing. Making small changes can have big results. That, too, is a kingdom principle. Sometimes it's just, just talk a little bit differently. Think a little bit differently. To just kind of hang around some different people majority of the time. Just small changes can have big results. That is true. But there's a different truth. For me, a more personal truth that I want to share with you. And we see that in verses 7 and 8 of 21, John. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, this is John the apostle said to Peter, it is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work. Basically, took his coat off, put it back on, and he threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits, about 100 yards, dragging the net full of fish. Over the years, I have explained Peter's actions this way, that, hey, Peter is just so impetuous. He's just so eager, you know, he just acts first and thinks later. He just jumped in the water. And that may have been true, but I saw something I had never seen before. And, and I, I choose to believe this is the reason why he did it. I think Peter, when John said, it is the Lord, I think Peter says, oh, my gosh. Oh, this is an answer to prayer, God. Thank you. I've been needing to talk with him. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And he said, oh, here's my chance. And he threw on his coat, and, and maybe his friends were saying, where are you going, man? <clears throat> we need your help. We can't get all these fish in. This thing weighs you know, hundreds of pounds in this little small boat. And Peter said, i got to go talk to the Lord. i need, I, need, I got to talk to him. Well, man, you can talk once we get in there. And he says, man, you, Peter said, you don't understand. <clears throat> you know what I did? You know what I did. I denied him. Not once, not twice, three times. And that third time he looked me right in the eye. Oh my gosh, I'm haunted. I can't even think of it. That image is seared in my mind. Me saying I don't know him and him looking at me. The man who made my life into something. I was a flunk out from rabbi school. I had to just go into dad's business because I was too dumb to get through school. And this guy came along and he tapped me in the shoulder. And man, for the last three years, I felt like somebody. I felt like I had a future. I felt like I found my calling. And I blew it. I blew it. I got to talk with him. He said, I'm sorry, guys. You're going to get that fishing by yourself. And boom, he jumped in. And I think when he got there, I think, I think he went on his knees. I think he just fell and said, oh, Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Can you forgive me? I'm sorry. I'm so ashamed. I'm so ashamed of myself. I bragged. I was the strongest. Told you I'd never leave you. Everybody else will turn on you. I said I'd never leave you. Oh, can you forgive me? Lord. And I don't think Jesus said a whole lot to him. I really don't. I think he just maybe just held him. I think just the fact that he came after Peter, the fact that he was received him, I think he said, Peter, just sit down. I know, I know, sit down. Let me, let me cook. I'm cooking some breakfast for the boys. He was cooking fish breakfast. And the guys came in there and they were excited to see Jesus too and Peter's still wondering, what's, man, what's next? What's going to happen now? 
Then as you go on the story, he says, Peter, Jesus, do you love me? I love you, Lord. <clears throat> he asked him, do, do you agape me? Do you love me unconditionally? See, that was Peter's boast. I, I love you, man, so much I'll die for you. Do, do you love me that way, Peter? And Peter says, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I have strong feelings for you. Do you agape me? You know that I phileo you. Peter, do you phileo me? Lord, you know I phileo you. You know I care for you. Oh, Lord, you, you know that, God. I'm, I'm tired of being a phony. I'm tired of pretending to be somebody that I'm not. Lord, I do. I really do care for you. And I want to love you the way that I'm supposed to. What, what is the third kingdom truth I'm talking about here? It's that confession and repentance bring healing. It's so simple. It's, we miss it. It's so simple, it's maybe said so often that we miss it. I'm not against counseling. I, it has its place. I'm not against therapy. I, it has its place. But I think for a large majority of God's people, if they would just simply confess their sin to God and to those that they've hurt and be honest with themselves on how frail they are and how weak they are and call out and say, God, please forgive me and I repent and God, I need, I need your help. I'm desperate, God. Peter was desperate. He, you had to be desperate to jump into a, a lake and swim 100 yards in fully clothed. Desperate. God meets desperate people. If you have a controlling sin, if you've got a bad marriage, I don't whatever it is, and you want some change, then, then you've got to get desperate. I, I've seen in the addiction world, the recovery world, it's the desperate people who find freedom, who are desperate saying, God, I, I need you. I'm, whatever it takes, I'll do whatever it takes. Same thing in marriage. Same thing with controlling sin. Right here on this campus, many moons ago, this pastor, two years being a pastor, went home for dinner up off of College Avenue, right behind East High School where Vicki and I lived, and did what I did, did what I do in those days, get on my wife, critical. I don't know, the dinner wasn't cooked right or it wasn't in time or the kids, whatever it was. I was harsh and critical. And, man, I said something again, and it must have been the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back, and Vicki broke and she went down her hands and knees, and, and, and I'll never forget in a fetal position crying, I can't, I can't take it, I can't, I can't, I, I can't do this. See, she'd been talking to me, saying, you're hard. You're critical. And in my sick mind, I said, you're weak. You are weak. You didn't grow up in an alcoholic family. You didn't grow up in the east side. You're soft. I'm serious. That's how sick I was. You're soft. This is life, honey. This is, how, this is how it is. Not that big of a deal. And man, when I saw my strong wife in a fetal position, man, the light came on. I said, oh my gosh, she's right. And I was ready to stop making excuses. I was ready to quit justifying my behavior. I was ready to stop blaming others for, for my issues. And I told her I was sorry and I had to get back to work. And I came into the prayer closet that Valley Bible had at that time, the men's bathroom in the old, <laughs> where the children's sanctuary is. And I went in there and cried. Say, God, she's right. I'm wrong. And I confessed my sin and something broke. Something broke. Now, I didn't immediately, you know, stop. But that was the breaking point. And from that point forward, I'm a completely changed man. But it began with desperation. I was desperate saying, God, I can't do this. I'm going I'm to kill her. I'm going to break her. So the hope for you here today, here's the hope for some of you, is that a time just to come clean like Peter did. Just, just say, Lord, I'm desperate for you. I, I, I need to talk with you. I need to connect with you. I need all that you have. My life is, was so much better with you than it was now that I'm without you. It was so much better when I was close with you rather than being so far away now, and I want to come close again, and I, but I need to become clean. I need to confess. 
I, I, I need to stay close to you from here on out. And that's the hope that some of you have here today. Your life can change completely if, if you will take that posture. So just bow your heads if you would. Father, I want to pray for those that are here today, Father. And Lord, maybe my story is somebody else's story here today. Maybe it's Peter's story that they've just, oh, they've made such a huge mistake and they've betrayed the people that they've loved. They've, they've betrayed the people closest to them. Or maybe there's some people here who once walked with you and now they've fallen away and maybe they're thinking, oh, that God has done for me and look what I've done for him, man. I've left him. I'm, I'm not close to him. I'm not seeking him. I'm not doing what he'd want me to do. And Or maybe, maybe you just don't even know God and you're just saying, man, maybe that's what I'm missing. Maybe that's what I'm missing, a relationship with God through Christ. Whatever the case may be, I want to just pray for those of you that are here today and I want you just to, to just hear what God's saying. I want you to make some decisions if you need to make some decisions right where you stand here today. This could be a real turning point in your life. You could have one of those moments that I had years ago where the light just comes on and you make some decisions that'll just change your life for good. Father, I pray for everybody here, Lord, who needs to, to receive that message, God. Lord, that they would uh, just come to you and they would talk with you and, and they would... Uh, confess and repent if they need to. I, I pray for those that are here, God, who they're not in your word, Father. They don't know how to raise kids. They don't know how to handle uh, the sin in their life. They don't know how to, to be married. Lord, I pray they get in your word, Father. They would, they would just get in your word. They get in a Bible study plan. They get in a Bible study group. I pray there's people here, Lord, who are just frustrated because God hasn't laid out the whole plan for their life. Maybe they're single and they're frustrated that God hasn't sent them a, a mate. Oh, God, let them just, just focus on the where. Am, am I where I'm supposed to be? And if that's the case, okay, I, that's good. I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be. God will show me what's next. He'll, he'll bring what's next. Oh, God, let that just bring hope and faith to their heart. And so, Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for what you spoke to us here today. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Always good to see you. We'll see you next time. We hope you got something awesome from the message today. We would love to hear what God is doing in your life. So if you have a God story, you can email it to share at vbf.org. Visit our website, vbf.org, for the latest information. You can also follow our social media accounts and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for watching, and we hope to see you again.